Today's video takes us to Soham in Cambridgeshire, England, where the course of events that took place on August 4th, 2002 would change the town forever. It was on this day that Ian Huntley murdered best friends Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman. They were both only 10 years old. This murder shook the UK and beyond, not only because of the simply awful loss of life and innocence, but because the man responsible was someone that both girls knew and trusted. We're visiting the town of Soham 20 years on to see the significant locations and get a feel for the geography and the distance between the places involved in this case. We're very aware that feelings are still raw here and perhaps always will be. Two decades is only a drop in the ocean for a loss such as this. So as unobtrusively as we can, we'll film this pretty Cambridgeshire town, visit the crime scene and the final resting places of Holly and Jessica. It was a lovely summer day on August the 4th, 2002. It was a couple of weeks into the school holidays and Holly and Jessica were excited to be meeting up again. Jessica had been on holiday with her family and she'd bought a present for Holly, a necklace with an H pendant. The two ten-year-olds had been best friends throughout their lives and only lived around the corner from each other. It was a Sunday and so far it had been a great weekend for Holly. On the Saturday she'd been shopping with her mum and her other friend Natalie. Her mum had bought her her very first bra as well as new trousers. Her friend had slept over and when Jessica called round all three of them played together on the computer. Natalie went home around lunchtime but Jessica stayed. She'd asked her parents if she could stay for lunch and then again for dinner. Holly's parents were having a barbecue that day and they were glad for Holly that she'd got a friend over to keep her company. Jessica's parents were used to the two of them being at each other's houses and they only wanted to know what time they needed to pick her up. Even though they lived minutes away from each other, Jessica's parents wouldn't have wanted her walking home alone after it got dark. Although Holly was initially wearing her new clothes, she later changed into her Manchester United football kit. This was so she could match what Jessica was wearing. Both shirts had the number seven on the back, David Beckham's shirt, and the favourite of them both. Holly's mum took what would be the last photograph of them. From the clock above their heads, it could be seen that it's just after 5pm. The two friends stand close together, smiling at the camera. They look happy and proud of their matching outfits. Only hours later, they will be gone. And this photo would be seen on televisions across the country. 20 years on, this iconic image is burned into the minds of so many of us. Unforgettable and representative of so much more than what it should have been. Not a sweet memory from a childhood past, but the heartbreaking memory of a childhood stolen. Only an hour after this photograph was taken, the girls left Holly's bedroom and popped out to get some sweets from the local leisure centre. The journey should have only taken a few minutes, so they hadn't told anyone that they were going. The journey took them past the home of Ian Huntley who lived right next to Soham College, where he worked. It was just a few hundred yards away from the leisure centre they would never reach. For some reason, they entered his house. What ploy he used, we can only speculate. We know that they had reason to trust him, as he was the boyfriend of Maxine Carr, who was their favourite teacher from primary school. We know that when the door closed behind them, they would not leave alive. Before the sun set on that perfect summer day, Ian Huntley would snuff out their lives for reasons he has never explained, and doubtfully ever will. The road we're now driving down is the road where Jessica lived. We're taking a drive to the street where Holly lived to show just how near it was. In a moving moment, we pass two young girls walking together and it feels a little chilling. It's hard 
not to imagine 20 years ago Holly and Jessica walking along together along these very streets. Excited. Happy. Chattering about what was important to them. Carefree. Innocent. With no greater pressing thoughts than what to do the following day on their six-week break from school. And this is it. The street where Holly lived. I've deliberately not filmed her house. But this is the area where she spent her final afternoon with Jessica. Leaving for a walk to the leisure centre. A journey so quick there was no need to let anyone know. They'd be back in minutes, they thought. At about 8.20 that evening, when the guests were leaving the barbecue, Holly's mum went upstairs to check on the girls. It was then that she realised that they weren't in the house. The curfew, which Holly always observed, was half past eight, so she expected them to be back any minute. By 8.45, she began to really worry, as this was out of ordinary for them both. Holly's dad went out to look for them. By 10pm, the police had been called, and many more local people were out helping to look. The girls' movements had been picked up by CCTV, and eyewitnesses also remembered them due to their matching red football shirts. One witness referred to them as the two Beckhams. They were seen going into the leisure centre to buy their sweets, and they were witnessed skipping arm in arm as they went about. One witness who had seen the girls that day was Ian Huntley, the caretaker at Soham Village College. He came forward voluntarily to tell police that he'd spoken to both girls. He told police that he'd been at the front of his house, washing down his dog, and that they'd both stopped to talk to him. Now this part of the story could well be true, as they really liked his girlfriend, Maxine Carr, who'd been their favourite teaching assistant. And Jessica loved dogs. It's not a stretch to think that they might have chatted to him. According to Huntley, they went off in the direction of the library. Only no one else has come forward and talked about seeing them beyond this point. Ian Huntley appeared to be the final witness, and upon talking to him, they vanished. He claimed that his girlfriend, Maxine Carr, was home at the time and had been in the bath. Ian became a familiar face during the hive of media scrutiny in the town. The story was covered daily on the news and Huntley was eager to talk to news crews about his meetings with the girls. Many people will be familiar with his interview outside his house. He actively joined in the search and he was eager to inject himself into the inquiry and even provide his opinion on how the girls might react in a stranger danger situation. This was very odd, as he hardly knew them. He was reported as saying that he thought Holly would go quietly, but that Jessica would put up a fight. This has chillingly been considered to reflect Huntley's inside knowledge as to what really happened. Many reporters who witnessed Huntley's behaviour and disturbing comments began to be highly suspicious of his involvement. They passed their concerns on to the police. As the days wore on, fears for the safety of the girls grew. Their families were distraught, knowing that they wouldn't have run away. The nation also watched and waited, beginning to fear the worst as no trace of them were found. The extensive reporting and the interviews with both Huntley and Maxine Carr began the unravelling of Huntley's version of events. It transpired that Carr was not at home with Huntley on August the 4th, as he claimed, but she was visiting her mother, a hundred miles away. She had lied. Phone records show that she had made a number of calls to him that day. He had been alone, and he had no alibi. Concerns were raised even further when Carr referred to Holly in an interview in the past tense, saying, She was a lovely girl. Troubling stories surrounding Huntley's past were also emerging. How he had underage girlfriends. There had also been accusations of assault and rape. On August the 16th, both Huntley and Carr were questioned by the police. But at this point, they were released without charge. 
Police searched the nearby college where Huntley worked and on August the 17th they found the burnt remains of the girls' clothes in a bin. From here everything changed and they knew it had now become a murder investigation. So this is Soham Village College and this is where Ian Huntley um, worked. Okay, just to show you how close it is. There's the college. Oh, the wind. This. This patch of ground here. This grass. If you look at photos you can see the tennis courts there. This is where his house was. This is where Holly and Jessica met their deaths at the hand of somebody that they knew and trusted. And of course the building at the back there is where he where he hid their clothes, where he burnt their Manchester United shirts and hid the remains of them where he worked. He'll be in a building at the back here. Yeah, we searched around here and had a couple of false where well, we thought we found it, but this is it. This is definitely the place where his house was stood. This is the sports centre and this is where um, they were going to get some sweets. So obviously would have walked straight past Huntley's house. And obviously they never got here. Very odd looking sports centre. I don't know if I'm at the back of it. But yeah, this is literally right next to the college. Um, they were so close, both of them lived really near. It would have been a lovely sunny, sunny day. They just slipped out of their houses, literally five minutes down the road. Go get some sweets from here. Met someone they trusted, someone they knew, somebody who worked at the school. Later on, on the same day that their clothing was found at the school, the bodies of Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman were discovered in an irrigation ditch about 12 miles away near to Lake and Heath Airfield. They were badly decomposed and attempts had been made to burn their remains. A search of Huntley's car found that he had changed all four tyres the day after Holly and Jessica went missing. The garage advised that there had been nothing wrong with them. A deeper search of the house determined that something had happened there. There was a crack in the bath and a light was hanging by its cord. As Ian's alibi was a lie and evidence had been found at his place of work, he was eventually charged with murder. Maxine Carr faced charges of perverting the course of justice. Phone data using Jessica's phone showed that they were inside Huntley's house at 6.34pm. The phone was switched off 12 minutes later at 6.46pm. It is believed that at this time, the girls were already dead. Huntley refused to admit his guilt and he put both families through the added trauma of a full trial. His defence was preposterous. He claimed the girls chatted to him asking about Maxine. Holly had a nosebleed and they went into his house so he could help her. Huntley explained that Holly accidentally fell into the bath and drowned and that in trying to calm an hysterical Jessica, he'd accidentally killed her. 
With this ridiculous version of events and other forensic evidence, such as his fingerprints being on the bin liner where the clothes were burnt, his hair also found on the clothing, fibres from the girl's clothes were found in his home and on his boots. The jury didn't struggle to find him guilty. He was sentenced to a minimum of 40 years. His time in prison hasn't been kind to him, with other inmates attacking him, and on one occasion, his throat was slashed. Maxine Carr received three and a half years for perverting the course of justice. It's not believed that she took part in the murder, and she now has a new identity. Huntley's home, where the girls met their deaths, was demolished to try and help the healing of the town. This is the final place on our journey today. It's been a really quite emotional journey, quite a sad journey today. One of the things that struck me all the way through this really is just how close proximity everything is. From the homes that Jessica and Holly lived, just round the corner from each other. They were on their way to get sweets, literally five minutes down the road. And they passed Huntley's house, which was literally next door to Soham College where he worked. And just such a short distance away from where they were headed. And now here, This lovely churchyard. Again, a few minutes away from where they lived and where they grew up. And I'm going to have a walk around now. I know that they were buried together, which was really sweet. They were best friends did everything together. Let's have a look, see if we can find them. side by side 20 years on loving memory of Holly Marie Wells taken from us early so innocent and young her loving smile has gone forever and her hand we cannot touch we shall never lose sweet memories of the one we love so much. We will never forget you. Heaven's gain as it knows is simply you, Holly, our beautiful soul and rose. Jessica Amy Chapman, 1st of the 9th, 91. 4th of the 8th, 2002. Nobody is gone unless you want them to go. If you don't want them to go, then they will be with you forever. Loved and sadly missed by everyone. The sun's really shining on this final resting place. 
two lovely little girls taken by absolute evil now yeah, it's hard to know what to say when you're faced with when you're faced with this you look straight at it grave for two ten year old best friends side by side and you know they'd be like 30 years old now if they had the chance to live and yeah, here they are bury the stones to throw from where they lived where they went to school where their families still are such a shocking sad waste of life <laughs>